Good evening. The text we pray the Lord be pleased to speak to us from is the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. I want to speak tonight on the theme, Hear Him. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, we begin reading with verse 4. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if you wish. Let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. I'm amazed at how much I can know something to be true, but not experience it. I can know something to be true, but that knowledge not necessarily be reality. I know the Great Wall of China exists, but I've not taken one step of its 5,500-mile length. I've heard of the pyramids of Egypt, and I know they exist, but I've not looked upon them nor explored their inner chambers. I know about them but I've not experienced them. Have you yet discovered this fact also, that you yourself can know something, believe something, embrace something to be true, and still not experience it? But what pains me most is not that I have not experienced these amazing wonders of this world, but that I have not experienced more of my amazing God. The older I get, the more I feel indicted that I should know much more. I realize and catch myself having a real experience with Jesus, and then an hour goes by, and I've not thought about Him. And even worse, I've not consulted Him for my actions and decisions. I simply did what I thought was best. The three apostles of our text, Peter, James, and John, were given an astonishing glimpse into one of the most incredible occurrences in Jesus' life. They witnessed the transfiguration of Christ. They witnessed something out of this world, literally. But as marvelous as that event was, they did not experience it for what it really was. Having ears, they did not hear, and having eyes, they really did not see. All they knew was that Jesus was a most unique man and the most, who had the most unusual access to God. They did, yes, believe him to be the Son of God, but they really didn't know all that meant and they still didn't understand his deity and even less did they understand his coming death and resurrection. Mark says that after this experience, he told them not to speak about what they had seen on top of that mountain until he had been resurrected from the dead. Mark says the three question, what the rising from the dead meant. No understanding, no reality about what the Lord had spoken to them, and it wasn't the first time he had talked about his death and resurrection either. They could hear his voice, but they couldn't hear it. I'm not trying to employ double talk here, nor am I trying to be clever. They literally heard the voice of God here, but could not really hear it for what it said. Surely you know what I'm talking about, don't you? We don't stand in judgment of these three men. We have the Word of God and we read it, yet we often do not hear it. We can hear someone proclaim the Word of God to us contextually, grammatically, and historically accurate and still not hear what God says. How is it that we can hear God's Word and even get some mental comprehension, but it makes no impact? The hard truth is we're hard of hearing, most often to the voice of God. Now, my question is, why is that? That's what I want to address this evening. Why are we often hard of hearing 
and not able to hear when God speaks. Well, let me offer four reasons from the text for our hearing problem. Number one, we can't hear God because we can only hear our own voice. We can't hear God because all we can hear is our voice. So often our voice drowns out the voice of God. There are myriads of voices from different perspectives fighting for our attention, but there is one voice we hear above them all, and that voice is our own. My friend, God will not compete for your attention. And why should he? He's the Lord God. He made you. He shouldn't have to compete to be heard. Therefore, when your ear is not attuned to his voice as you're reading his word and your heart is not truly spiritually attentive, you will not hear God. And the reason is because normally your voice speaks louder than his voice. I see this here in the text. Peter had the same problem. He couldn't hear what God had just said even though he heard the audible voice of God. All he could hear was what he thought was best. Notice what Peter says. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Immediately, Peter knew what was best. He knew what was needed to be done. He knew exactly how to respond to something like this. We need to build some temples. That's it. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. That's all we need to do. And Lord, if you be pleased to grant this request, we'll get to constructing immediately. Isn't that the way we often pray? No wonder we don't hear God's answer. Lord, this is what I think should be done. This is what I'm asking you for. This is what I believe that you should do for me. Would you bless this? Would you sign off on this? It's hard to hear God when you're introducing to him your plans. When you bring to the Lord your ideas and what he needs to do to help you do his will, he tends to grow silent. The problem is we're not able to hear what God is saying to us because... We're so focused on hearing what we believe ought to be done in the situation. How many times have you asked the Lord to do this one thing and you wanted it so badly that all you could think of in regards to prayer was God doing this thing for you? Well, did it ever occur to you that God might have a different idea? So often we cannot hear the word of the Lord because we've not done what is necessary to hear God speak through His word by His Spirit. And what is that? It's to say no to ourselves. To die to that self-impulse that wants to be in control. As long as you desire control, you cannot hear the voice of God. He does not compete with your voice. He will let you have your will and let it come to its logical conclusion. He will do that until you cannot hear the voice of God speaking to you. Your heart will become so dull, so hard of hearing, that even if he does speak, it doesn't register. I'd like to say something to those who are perhaps not yet followers of Christ. Now, my friend, please listen. Give me your attention. God is speaking to you at this very moment. I'm assured of that. I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm not deceived thinking I'm God. No, not at all. Nor am I arrogant enough to think that I'm somebody important and therefore my words take on the same import as if God were speaking. No, it isn't that either. I know God is speaking because the Lord has ordained to speak through preaching. Yes, even poor, stammering preaching such as mine. If I give you exactly what the Bible says, then it is the voice of God speaking, speaking to you. He is simply using my voice to express what he has already said in this book 
And he is saying it to you right now. Hear him. And despite the fact God is speaking to you, you choose to believe the lie and think, I don't want to serve the Lord because serving him would be difficult and miserable. This is often what people think about serving Jesus. They think if you serve the Lord and become a Christian, you need to get ready for a hard and difficult and miserable life. Let me tell you, that voice is a lie. Jesus is the most joyful being in the universe. He said to his disciples, my joy, my joy, I give to you. If Jesus was not the most joyful person that Peter, James, and John knew, then when he said, my joy, I give to you, do you think they would want it? Do you think they wanted to follow a sad sack? or be eager to have the joy of the Lord if he was a miserable person. He was not a miserable man. He was full of joy. And yet he was also acquainted with grief and sorrow. I know it's hard for you to comprehend, but listen to me clearly. God created you to enjoy pleasure which is centered in him. Think about it. Where did the Lord put man when God created him? He put him in a paradise. Why? Because he wanted man to be happy, joyful, and experience his pleasures. He didn't put man in a vast desert wilderness. He put him in a joyful place, a place of great pleasure. And so I say, it's a lie to believe that if you surrender yourself to Jesus, that somehow you're going to be made miserable. I am here to tell you, you've never known joy yet until you meet Jesus Christ and know him in his reality. I've heard so many people say, even Christians, I know I need to give Christ my life, but maybe if I do, he'll call me as a missionary to Africa or China, or I may have to do something I won't enjoy. God is so gloriously good that if he was to call you to be a missionary to Africa or China, You'd be so delighted to go. It'd be your greatest pleasure. And if you didn't go, you'd be most miserable. Listen, obedience to God is a good thing. Don't listen to the voice that will drown out the voice of God. Be saved today. No joy beyond measure. No pleasures forevermore today. Come to Christ. Do not listen to your own voice. Listen to the voice of God. Hear Him. Is there anybody here burdened and heavy laden? Jesus said, come, and he will give you rest. Listen to him. Come to him. Hear him. Maybe something inside tells you you cannot live the Christian life. I want to answer that. Neither can I. I can't live that kind of life either. But once again, That's a distorted view of what it means to be a Christian. Jesus not only died for our sins, but he rose from the dead so that his life and power could live through you. The very personality of Jesus can live in you. Think about that. The God of gods, the creator of this universe can live inside of you, man. Sir, think about that. It's not you trying to serve and be like Jesus. No, no. It's Jesus being Jesus in you. We cannot hear God because our voice is often dominant. Well, number two, the second reason for our hearing problem is we can't hear God because our ears are tuned to the voice of man, our Ears are tuned to the voice of man. We're so concerned about what people think and say about us. Six days earlier, Peter was rebuked for this very thing. Jesus had told them he was going to Jerusalem to die and he would be resurrected. Peter takes Jesus aside personally, instructs him, and essentially says, Now listen. We'll not have any more discussion about you dying. (laughs) No, that's not going to happen. And I'm going to make sure it doesn't. 
But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Peter's mind was attuned to what people thought, so he could hear only his concerns and fears about others, the ways of man. He couldn't hear what Jesus was trying to explain to them. And often this manifests itself as a fear of man. Listen to what the proverb says. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man brings a snare. When you're more fearful about what people think about you than you are of God's approval and what he thinks of you, you'll always fall into the trap that will lead to spiritual failure. You cannot hear God if what people think about you is dominating your mind. And this is one of the reasons why a sinner cannot hear God. He or she fears what people will think if they surrender to Christ. I've heard this dozens, scores of times over the years. I'm sure you've heard it as well. Maybe you've said it. You're wrestling with this very thing. I know I need to give my life to Christ. I know my life isn't right. I know there's something missing in my life. But if I give my life to Jesus, what will my friends think? They'll no longer want to be my friends. What about my family? What will they think of me? They'll disown me. They'll have nothing to do with me. There is a price to follow Jesus. Yes, some may no longer want to be your friend. It would be trying to pull the wool over your eyes to say that that may not happen or wouldn't happen. Some will betray you. Some will despise you. Some of them may be your own family members. Jesus was very clear. If you follow him, there is a cross. However, if you could just hear God speak to you right now, you would hear him promising you something better than any friend could offer. He says he will be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You don't know what a friend is like until you know Jesus don't believe the voice that is afraid of man and not God. He wants to be your friend. What was it said of Abraham, the man of faith? It is said of him in the scriptures, he was the friend of God. I can only say to my brothers and sisters this evening that friendship with God is so powerful. Hunger for it. And if you want to be a friend of God, You've got to put God first. Don't let your ear be attentive to the opinion of others. Otherwise, if you do, you cannot hear God. Well, number three, the third reason we have difficulty hearing God is we can't hear God because of being overwhelmed by needs. We can't hear God because we're overwhelmed by the need, the crisis of the hour. There is a fleshly compulsion when we're in trouble to do something, to perform, to get out of the problem as quickly as possible. But the Spirit, the person who waits on God and His leadership, that's the person who knows peace and contentment. And here's how you can tell the difference between a mature believer and an immature believer. The mature believer has learned through years of failure to wait on God. And that not every need is always as pressing as it might appear at the moment. Have you learned that? Boy, you think this is it. This is the most terrible thing to happen. You've got to exercise yourself immediately and do something. But as time goes on, you discover it wasn't as bad as you thought at the beginning. Again, our text says, Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter's first response to this holy and spectacular event was to do something spiritual. Now we see the need. 
The need is that people need to recognize you, Jesus, as the Messiah. We are get it. We're getting it. But the rest of the people, they don't get it. So let's build some temples. Let's forget about the temple in Jerusalem. We need some new temples. One for Moses representing the law and one for Elijah representing the prophets. And now, Lord, we need one for you, Jesus, the Messiah. And the people of Israel will see the whole plan of God in these three temples. That's the need as Peter saw. And when needs are of the more personal nature, the louder they shout at us. We can't hear the Lord because we're all consumed with our wants, worries, and woes. Pain can be very loud. It doesn't need amplification to be heard. Someone said that, quote, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. He went on to say, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And yet, that being so, it's amazing how we can still miss what God is saying to us because the message gets lost in the sorrow, the shock, and the suffering. What's God trying to tell you? Well, you don't know because you don't hear because all you can focus on is the pain. I'm not suggesting that pain is to be ignored. No, not at all. As already stated, God does shout in our pains. And that is being said, having said that, that doesn't mean that pain should be the focus, though. The problem shouldn't be prominent. It's not primary, friend. It's the package for what is primary, the Lord's purpose for you. Many times over, dear people, people who are hurting from the wounding of life will ask me, how do I solve this issue that is delivering me this pain? And what they're asking is, how do I remedy this? How do I stop the pain? How should I approach the crisis? Having in the mind, fixing the dilemma. That's all they want. That's the only thing they're seeking. Fix the problem. My answer is often something like this. Before you pray for God to change the circumstances, you should give some thought to what God is saying to you. There very well could be something the Lord wants to reveal to you about your heart. So don't be in a hurry to fix anything if you will just listen. The pain may expose an underlying issue in you. It may actually in the end have very little to do with what you think is the real issue. Hear Him. And it's often in our pain, our suffering, our affliction, God is trying to refine us, sanctify us, conform us. But because we're so focused on the pain, we can't hear that. Well, number four, we can't hear God because we can only think about theology. Now, this doesn't apply just to everyone. Most often it applies to church leaders, preachers, and pastors theologians. But I want you to look again at this text because it's right here in the text. Peter's mind is pointed toward theology. And it's very evident later in verse 10. Peter says, okay, we're going to build three temples. And all of a sudden, the voice of God speaks. There was nothing subjective about it. It was very objective. A voice from heaven boomed. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Listen to Him. Do what He says. What would you think would be the first thing out of your mouth, having heard the voice of God, having seen Moses and, and Elijah, and of course Jesus transfigured in glory and beauty right there in front of you? What would be the first thing out of your mouth? Amazing, wasn't it? Peter and James and John, they'd never met Moses or Elijah. They had lived hundreds of years earlier, and yet they had instant recognition. And there is this Jesus in his pre-incarnate glorification. 
What do you think the first thing out of your mouth would be? For the three disciples, here's what they said. Verse 10. Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come? First, it was a theological question. There was a debate going on among some of the religious people of the day. Is Elijah going to come back prior to the Messiah? Some said, yes, it would be Elijah himself. Others said, no, no, it won't be Elijah, but one who's like Elijah in life and ministry. Others, like the Sadducees, said there was no resurrection or life after death. And so this was the huge theological debate of the times. And the first thing these guys want to talk about after witnessing this great scene is not to hear what Jesus had to say to them, but rather they wanted an answer to their theological dilemma. I want to be kind but faithful to you and the Lord, so I say with the greatest respect, one of the reasons why the church may not be doing so good and the will of the Lord right now, why she may not be doing so well, is because we're too concerned about threading theological needles. Now let me hasten to say that theology is good. Theology comes from two Greek words, theology. Theo means God, ology, the study or the knowledge of something. In this case, the knowledge of God. I remember my, my pastor as a young man telling me when I was a teenager that he called a church that didn't have a pastor to inquire about the position. He wanted to know about their doctrine and their theology. An appropriate question. The receptionist answered and introduced, as he introduced himself and said, I, I'm here just to send a resume to you, and I, before I do, could you please tell me briefly what your theology is? And the receptionist said in a very gruff voice, oh, we don't believe in that theology stuff. We just worship God here. Well, needless to say, my pastor didn't send his resume in. Theology is very important. We're to study and to know God. Can you tell me what is higher than the pursuit of knowing God? Well, the answer is nothing. Therefore, God has given us the word full of truth and doctrine so that we can know Him. Why? So we can have theological discussions and debates about who God is and all the interesting differences about His plan for our lives. Come now. Absolutely not. That's not the reason. He gave us this book, He gave us doctrine. He gave us high truth so that we could draw near to Him in knowledge and worship Him. At least the lady had one thing right. They were there to worship God. She just didn't know that the study of the Scriptures is the means by which leads to that very end. And worship without doctrine is shallow if not sensational at best. It doesn't soothe the heart. It doesn't edify the soul. I'm not trying to be harsh or critical. I believe this has great impact, especially among reform circles of which we would say we are identified with. There's too much narrowness in our theology. We're more concerned about whether someone is a Calvinist or an Arminian rather than a follower of Jesus. We're more concerned about whether someone's a Baptist or a Methodist more concerned about whether one can believe prior to regeneration or after regeneration. When the truth is we don't, we don't even know how the Spirit comes. We just know He comes. Now, I believe that only someone who's regenerated can exercise faith. But if somebody doesn't believe that and yet they show me the fruit of the Spirit and the evidence of the life of Christ in them, they are my brother, they are my sister. We can become too narrow in our theology. Theology is given to expand us in the worship of God by knowing God better. 
We've narrowed the study of theology to specifics that split and divide us, and therefore we can't hear God and his purpose and will for our lives. Am I saying abandon our doctrines? Absolutely not. Just the opposite. Let's get to studying. Let's get to knowing God in his reality and in his truth as he really is. The more I know information and the truth about him, the more I'm amazed I'm captured. I'm carried along by the beauty of Christ. But if the study of this book is motivated because you're more concerned about having your doctrine right than knowing and worshiping and obeying God, my friend, something is wrong with you. You're not right. You're not right with God. Here again, the person who's not a disciple of Jesus cannot hear God Because he or she's trying to understand all the mysteries before they believe upon Jesus. You're trying to figure out the whole thing. You don't need to understand everything and all mysteries in order to follow Jesus. No, you don't. In fact, you can't. I don't know all there is to know. I'm so far from understanding so many things. As I said a few moments ago, the older I get, I feel more of an indictment that I should be further along. But my friend, we're dealing with an infinite being, a perfect being. We can't even conceptualize perfection, much less his eternality. All you need to know is this. He is who he said he was. And he will do what he said he will do. Within that sentence, there are certain principles. Here they are. You are not like him. You've transgressed his ways. You've rebelled and rejected him. You've not come under his submission. You don't want to do what he has wanted you to do. You have willfully acknowledged that you have not submitted your life to him. But now you want to. What is that? What is that desire that was not once there? My friend, rejoice. It is faith and repentance. God is working in you. Faith and repentance is all he asks of you. Not your religious works. Not your great theological knowledge. No, simply to trust him and obey him. That's all that's required. To come to Christ. And when you come to Christ... He's not asking you to join a club or a religious institution. He's asking you to give your life to him and become his follower. The Bible says you must trust in him, believe upon him. What does that mean? It means you so trust your life to him that you know he has everything necessary to get you home safely. He's accomplished everything and will accomplish all you need. No matter what happens in your life, you know he will see you through and he'll get you home safe. It's not just forgiveness of sin and escaping hell. Trusting Jesus means trusting him with everything about you. You believe what he said he would do. You believe he is who he said he was. That's what faith is. And it's just not a head knowledge. Oh no, it's a conviction. A conviction that mobilizes you to act upon it. Because it's real to you. Jesus becomes real. Again, God doesn't require you to pass some theological test or exam. The Bible says if you Simply trust him with yourself. And that's all you know, that he will rescue you from your sin and death and hell. That's all you know, that his blood was sufficient for your sins. My dear friend, you are saved. If you can put your eternity and stake it on that, then you've met with God. There are a lot of mysteries about God. God is infinite, he's eternal, he's transcendent, he's imminent. All of these amazing words. 
How do you think you could understand such a person? How do you understand infinity? With this small, limited mind and finite heart, there's absolutely no way. <laughs> it amazes me that all God said to Abraham when he was an idolater in the Ur of Chaldees was simply this. Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's all he said to him. Abraham, get up and leave and go to a place I'm going to show you. You don't know where that is, but I'll lead you. Abraham did not know where he was going or how he was going to get there. He didn't know what he would find when he got there. In fact, my friend, he didn't know where he was going, so he wouldn't know when he got there. He had to depend upon one thing only. And what was it? Hearing God. Hearing God. Jesus said this, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. One day Jesus said some very hard things, difficult things for the thousands that were listening to him that day to understand. And most of them left him. And then turning to the twelve disciples, he says, My words are spirit and they are life. Hear him. Your life depends upon it. Your life was made to live not by bread alone, but by the very hearing of God in your spirit, in your mind, in your soul. Hear God. And what does God say? He says the exact same thing that he said to those men on that Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He points you to Christ. He gives testimony to the resurrected Savior. And he says to you, he says to me, hear him. Abraham did it. and He was called the friend of God. That's all God's asking you to do. Just obey Him. Don't be surprised when He directs your path and He doesn't tell you how it's all going to end. He won't. Because what He wants most from you is simple, childlike faith to trust Him. How do I hear God? Make your voice secondary to God's Word. Don't fear people more than God. Don't let people direct you or let what they think of you guide you in your obedience to God. Don't let the need of the very moment persuade you to act according to your own wisdom. No, sir, let God influence you according to His plan for your life. And lastly, don't start studying this book in order to get theologically intelligent. Study the theology of this book in order to know God better and so that you can hear Him. I pray God has spoken to you as I've spoken this evening. It's my prayer that somehow supernaturally beyond my abilities that God will speak as I'm speaking to you. I really believe that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let's not argue how he communicates that word, nor let us thread the theological needle so tightly that we forget he is a God who is to be experienced. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all of thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Hear Him. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, I plead in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, speak. Plow through the noise and get to the very heart 
of those listening right now. All the voices that clamor for their attention. Please, Lord, be so perceptible in your communication to them that they recognize this voice is different. And they will listen, whether saint or sinner, saved or lost. Oh, God, we need you. I need to hear daily your word. Thank you for this book by which you primarily and mostly speak to us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who's been given to take this word and make it personal and real and understandable. Teach us, Lord. Teach us Jesus so that we will hear him. It is in his name we pray. Amen.